Father, please come with your spirit. Touch my lips, touch our hearts. Fulfill the plan that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. I heard a story about a girl, her name was Leslie. She was an SDA member. She would come to church every Sabbath. She was a singer in the choir. By the way, we have a choir and we need singers and we are consistent. We keep practicing and we will not give up and we will keep singing, praising the Lord. Help us. She was a singer in the choir. She was teaching children Sabbath school. And she was one of the deaconesses in the church. And she came to church dressed nicely and she behaved. However, every Saturday night when she would get home, she would go back to her life. And church happened one day a week. And she was in the habit of drinking with her uncle. And she would spend about 500 a week on alcohol. And not just drinking, but she was into movies so much that she would not miss one movie, regardless if it was good, bad, dirty. There are no good movies. Very few, maybe one in a million, but she did not miss one. And she was into other many other things that I'm not going to mention. And so a guy knocks in her door, and his name is Chris. And he's a Hindu. And he says... I am Chris, I am a Hindu, and I want to tell you about God. I encountered God. And he says, ha, I am Leslie, I am an Adventist, and I know about God everything. There is nothing you can teach me. I know the Bible. I know the doctrines. I could teach you. And he says, well, are you transformed? And she says, uh, yes. And he says, you are not supposed to lie. I see you how you say, uh, yes. I said, well, I've been trying hard. It doesn't work. He said, well, then you may know a lot of doctrines. You may know a lot about God, but you don't know God. And he says, I know God. I don't know so many doctrines. I said, you cannot know God. You are a Hindu. He says, well, would you agree that God loves me? Yes. Would you agree that God wants me saved? Yes. Then why do you think that I don't know God? And he says, would you agree that we study together? And she says, yes, if we bring my Bible studies. Says, I don't have a problem. As long as we study about God, I can study anything. So he brings another seven. And she brings another few of her friends, drinking friends. And they study together. At the end of the study, all of them get baptized. Including her rebaptized. And she says to Chris and to the pastor, I've been trying hard to keep the doctrines. It never changed me. But Chris taught me what it means to meet God face to face. So church, I am asking you today, you, most of you are church members or Christians. You come to church, obviously you are here. It's not your clone it's you, hopefully. You keep Sabbath. You may be involved in evangelism. You may sing in the choir. You may be an elder or a deacon or a Sabbath school teacher. You may know all the doctrines. You may eat your broccolis. But have you seen God face to face? Have you encountered God face to face? Or you know just about God? Isaiah was not a sinner. He was a prophet. Isaiah was a prophet. Working for God, keeping Sabbath, eating clean, but his religion was empty, lifeless, focused on forms, making sure that he keeps all the forms properly. Making sure that he follows all the doctrines. Folks, doctrines are good, don't get me wrong, but they will never save anybody. You need to know the God of the doctrines. You follow me? Isaiah 
all the scholars agree. Archaeology says the Hebrew grammar in the Bible in Isaiah chapter 1 through 5 says that Isaiah was all focused on forms and very judgmental. Did you hear what I said? How was he? Focused on forms and, well, folks, they go together. People who focus on forms, they are those who judge the others. Very judgmental. He started his ministry in 755 BC. And between chapter 1 and chapter 5, he is judging, 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 judging all forms, all criticizing. In chapter 6, something happened. Scholars and archaeology believe that chapter 6 took place in year 740. So between 755 BC and 740, we have how many years? 15 years of being a prophet, serving God, and having a cold, lifeless religion. Keeping the forms properly, but not knowing the God of the forms. In chapter 6, something happened that would change his life. Totally, dramatically change his life forever. And we'll learn about that today. Let us read the quotation as we start. The quotation that Beth put in the bulletin, and it happens that without me talking to her, I had it on my PowerPoint to start with. Isaiah had denounced the sin of the others, but now he sees himself exposed to the same condemnation. Isaiah has been satisfied with called lifeless religion in worshiping God. And he had not known this until the vision was given to him. How little now appeared his wisdom and talents and religion. And he looked about the sacredness and majesty of the glory of God. The holiness of God in the sanctuary. How unworthy he was compared to God. How unfitted for sacred service. Bible Commentary, Volume 4, page 1139. So, 15 years of serving God, good Adventist, pastor, elder, I don't care, Sabbath school teacher, condemning others until he had a vision about God. So, <clears throat> he imagined himself as good, as righteous. He said, I am a sinner. But he didn't feel the burden of sin. He said, I know God. But he knew about God. And he didn't know that he doesn't know. Because he was blind, naked, and deaf. And he to take a vision of God to really open his eyes. Like in Revelation 3, you are this way and you don't know how you are. That's the problem. So what happened in this man's life that changed his life forever? There are three things that happened when he had the vision. Three things that happened. And I would like you, as we read the Bible verse, to watch for those three things that happened. How many things? Okay, let's watch for them. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple. Above he stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered the face, with two covered the feet, with two he flew. One cried to another one and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door was shaken by the voice who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Wow, is me, for I am done. I'm done. Because I am a man with unclean lips. I do among people with unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the king. So what happened there, church? What happened there that changed his life? Isaiah had a vision of God. He sees the Lord face to face. Listen, folks. My eyes have seen the king. After 15 years of service and the life of being a church member and knowing about God, it is first time when this SDA sees God for himself face to face. So I am asking you, I'm not asking you what you know about God, but have you seen God face to face? Have you had a vision of God in his temple? Like Paul, honest, 
church member, thinking that he does the right thing for God, eating properly, keeping Sabbath, no question about it. On the road to Damascus, Paul sees the Lord face to face, and that changes his life. Isaiah has his Damascus experience now. Like Job, in Job 42 verse 5, I've heard about you, I've known about you, but now my eyes have seen you. Like Isaac, he says there in Genesis 26, 24, the God of my father. But then he has a dream and he sees God. And after the dream, he says, my God. And then not just Isaac, but Jacob too. He says, the God of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac. And after he has the dream and he sees God, he says, my God. Have you seen God? Because if you have not, your religion is empty and cold and formal, and you just know about God, but you are not saved. You have never experienced grace before, and you will never experience it. Because this is what Christianity is all about. It's not about the doctrines. It's not about knowing about God. It's not about coming to church. It's not what we say or what we think. It is experiencing God one-to-one, face-to-face. And that vision would change your life. Nothing else. Only that experience would lead you to surrender. Before you see God, you'll never surrender. David says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Have you tasted God? Do you know what it means to be forgiven, to be saved, to be changed, to be born again, or you just talk about it? You see it in the prodigal son. He leaves the pig pen and he goes back and sees the father face to face, and that changes him forever. You see in the woman that meets Jesus face to face, and that changes her. All the people in the Bible meet the Lord face to face. They see him, they hear him, they talk to him. Why it doesn't happen in our life? Have you met him? Not about him. So, Nicodemus, you need to be born again. Zacchaeus meets Jesus face to face. Come down, I need to enter your home. So you may ask, Pastor, I want to see him face to face. How do I do that? How do you do that? Simple. The Bible is so clear. The Bible is so clear. Hold on a second, I went too far. The Bible says, if you seek me with all your heart, you will find me, Jeremiah 29, 13. The Bible says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you, James 4, 8. When you really invite God, but you must mean what you ask. Daily, not one time in your life, but daily. When you invite him, to reveal himself to you, to enter your heart, to enter your house, he will reveal himself to you. He will get you ready. It may take a while, because if you see him and you are not ready, you are going to die. He will get you ready, and you will experience him. And listen, church. God doesn't enter your heart by accident. You really need to invite him daily. PhD people may know a lot, but they too need to meet Jesus face to face in order to be saved. Theologians may know a lot about God, but they too need to see him face to face to be saved. So, have you seen God in his temple? Or you just come Sabbath after Sabbath and your religion has no power? All godly people have seen him. If you don't experience him, you are not a Christian. Because this is what Christianity is all about. So, what happens next? Isaiah sees God. And then, what happens next? Listen. Very important. He sees God how? 
and where to know what happens next. When he sees God, he sees himself. What is that number two? Just to give you a little tip ahead. He sees his sinfulness. So how and where he sees God. The Bible is clear. He saw God how? High and exalted. And the train of his robe filled the temple and so on. And the angels covered their faces and their legs and so on. And God, the angel said, holy, holy, holy. So how did he see God? High, exalted, full of glory, holy, holy, holy. Folks, this is something that bothers me badly. Christianity talks a lot about God is love. God's love. Yes, God is love. But God is also holy. And they don't want to talk about it. Why? Because when we talk about God is love, we feel that that gives us the freedom to do whatever because God is love means God tolerates. You follow me? And that's the reason we have so many problems in the church, in families, in our life, so many sins. Because we don't see God high, exalted, holy. Having a wrong view about God makes us suffer so much. That's where the problems come from. In families, in church, everywhere. God is just love. God is not holy. I was in Romania, and they invited me to preach in a different church, different denomination. And I started to preach on this subject. And the pastor came to me after I said, we'll call you back, but never talk about his holiness, just talk about his love. I said, what are you talking about? God is holy. Yes, he is, but that's up to God. That's his attribute. It has nothing to do with us. Really? Oh, that's a matter of Old Testament. I said, really? Paul saw God in the New Testament, and he collapsed. John saw God in Revelation in the New Testament, and he collapsed. And God was full of glory and holy, and the temple and the angels and everything. God is holy in the New Testament too. Yeah, but that's God's business. Really, didn't Jesus say that if you love me, you follow me? You become like me? Yeah, but just to love, nothing else. Doesn't he say if you love me, you obey me? Yeah, but we don't need to. Really, who are you? Are you God? Christianity doesn't like to talk about God's holiness. Because God's holiness implies that we need a change. Some go to church. You see, he sees God how? Holy. And he sees God where? In his temple. That's what the Bible verse says. Folks, let me ask you. Have you seen God in his holiness? Number one. Number two. When you come to his temple, why do you come? If you come for programs, you're lost. If you come because this is the place where you can have some jobs and some control, you are sick. If you come because you have friends, I'm sorry for you, I'll pray for you. If you come here because it's the good thing to do, you will be lost doing good things. If you come because you need to keep Sabbath, Sabbath is not going to save you. You need to come here to see God. And if you don't see God, you break Sabbath. Because you don't keep Sabbath by not working. If you sanctify Sabbath by not working, lazy people sanctify every day. Yes. Nothing sanctifies Sabbath. Sabbath is a day like the other days. 24 hours. Doesn't have 25. God's presence sanctifies something. And Sabbath is holy because God comes on Sabbath to meet you and me. And because of God's presence, Sabbath is holy. And if you don't encounter God, you didn't keep Sabbath because that was the in intent of the Sabbath. That's the reason God gave you Sabbath. To meet Him. And if you don't meet Him, you don't keep Sabbath. You just keep a day, a form. It's not going to save you. You follow me? Have you seen the holiness of God? Do you come to the temple to see God? That's what we should do. Listen what happens. When he comes in the temple and he sees God holy, holy, holy. And he sees God in his temple. He basically collapses and he says, woe to me. Now, 
talking to that pastor from that church, I'm not going to mention the church. I told him a few Bible verses that I have them here for you. I said, hey, God is not just love or just holy. God is in the same time love and holy. Love and just. Because love and justice and holiness are the same thing. They are the same elephant look, that you look from a different angle. Because love would be no love without justice. Would you agree? Love would be no love without the truth. If you love somebody, you will not do something unjust against them. God is just because he loves us. Look what the Bible says. In God, mercy and truth meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. God requires that from you too. Execute true justice and show mercy. You see how they go together? He has shown you, man, what is good. Do justice, love mercy. Do you see how they go together? You cannot separate love and justice. Because they are the same thing. So, what happens to Isaiah when he sees the holiness of God in his temple? Isaiah says, woe to me. Because I am done. Listen, folks, why would the angels have six wings? And we'll get there in a second. Why would the angels, to fly faster? Really? Why? The Bible says, two wings to cover their face, two wings, basically to cover themselves, and just two to fly. Why would they cover themselves? Huh? Because the presence of God, the holiness of God, the glory of God, is so high that they could not even stand there. Angels, more over you and me. <laughs> when we talk about God and we think, oh, oh God, da, 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 and we take it so lightly, I wish we would encounter God because we would cover ourselves and we would collapse and we would think different about Him. When Isaiah sees God, Isaiah is changed. This is a balanced theology about God. This is to have an understanding of who God really is. He is love, but he is holy. Isaiah, when he sees how God really is, he says, woe to me, I am undone. I am a sinner, and I live among sinners. I've seen the Lord. Folks, number one, you need to see God as he is. When you see God, happens number two. What is number two, folks? When you see God, when you see God, you see how you are. You see how you are. It's not what you used to think about you. Because Isaiah chapter 1 through chapter 5, it's about the others. Isaiah chapter 6, when he sees God, it's about him. So let's move to the next point, and then I explain more this point. What happens after he sees that he is a sinner? What happens? A seraphim flew to me, having a live coal in his hand. And he touched my mouth, and he said, Your iniquity is taken away, your sin is atoned for. Listen, folks. Only those who see God face to face realize that they are sinners and they need God desperately. And only those who realize how they are experience grace. So if you have not seen God, if you have not understood how you are, you have never experienced grace. Life-changing grace. Because when you experience grace, you experience new birth. You will never be the same. And if you didn't experience that salvation, it means you don't know who you are and you don't know who God is. And you badly need this experience. Only when Isaiah sees God, he sees his sinfulness. And only when he sees that, he acknowledges his sinfulness. He says, woe to me. Only then the angels is sent to touch his lips to atone for him. Just then your sins are forgiven. God's wonderful grace becomes real only when you realize that you are lost. 
And you realize that you are lost only when you see God in his holiness. Compared to the holiness of God, you know that you are lost. Unless you see God, you'll never realize how lost you are. When you see God, you don't have time to judge others. Because compared to God, you are really bad. I have a burden. Listen, folks. We have a powerful message. Would you agree with me? A wonderful message. How is it that we preach this message Sabbath after Sabbath, week after week, for so many years, and we are not changed? How is it that we sing, we are marching to Zion, and we are in, marching to Egypt, or we are marching in the wilderness, going around and around and around, and between Kadesh and Jericho, it's 11-day trip, and it takes us 40 years, and we die in the wilderness. Why? Why do you think, oh, how I love Jesus, while we love Egypt, and we love self? If this message is so good, why people don't change? Could it be that we need Isaiah's vision? Could it be that we, not them, need to be born again? When we see God in his holiness, we finally See how we are. We don't have time to look to others because we are so lost that we are undone. We are ruined. And then, just then, we can finally experience grace, new birth, change, salvation, and joy. Just then. No one can ever appreciate and experience God's changing grace unless he would first realize how sinful and how lost he is. I just read it. If you want, you can read it again. <clears throat> this is what Solomon is talking about in Proverbs. Listen, only those that realize that they are sinners receive grace. The others that just talk about grace never experience it. When Isaiah sees God, he's filled with fear. And we say, oh, fear is not good. Really? The Bible says that fear leads to wisdom. Sure, the Hebrew word there is reverence, respect. Not that I'm afraid, but a lot of respect. Listen what the Bible says about fear, about that respect. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. The fear of the Lord is a, the reverence for the respect for the Lord is a fountain of life. Before Isaiah, before having this vision of God, he looked to others. Now he looks to self. When he really sees God, then he really sees self. He really realizes that, listen, folks, I am as lost as the others, I am not better. Woe to me! I'm ruined! I'm a sinner! Listen, very inter interesting. In chapter 3, woe to them, woe to them. Woe. In chapter 5, six times, I didn't put them all because I don't have room in the slide. In chapter 5, six times he says, woe to them, those who build house over house. Woe to them who call good ev evil and evil good. Woe to them who wake up early and go to sleep late to do what they need. Woe to them, woe to them, woe, 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 woe. To them. In chapter 6, after he sees God, he says, woe to me. When you see God, you don't have time to judge others. So folks, let me break it to you. Those people that point fingers. I mean, Isaiah had a machine gun. And after he sees God, he says, it's me. Those church members who judge others and point fingers. Those people are the people that have never seen God, have never seen self, and have never experienced grace. They are sick people. If you have a problem in your life, and I don't know if you do or not, 
and you think that it is his or her fault, you are sick. You need to see Jesus. Because he or her may be guilty, but you are not better. In God's presence, we are just the same. We are not better than the prostitutes. We are just the same. We all need grace. I'm sorry to break it to you, but that's the truth. When you see Jesus, you say, it's me, it's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Our nature has the tendency to be proud, to blame the others for my own mistakes. From beginning, from Adam and Eve, it's her, it's him, it's the snake, it's you, but never self. It's human pride that leads to so much suffering and eventually to death, eternal death. To see our own character, it takes encountering God. People who are judgmental, people who are judgmental, they have never experienced forgiveness and grace. They've never experienced grace because they have not seen how sinful they are. They have not seen how sinful they are because they have never encountered God and His holiness in His temple face to face. From Genesis to Revelation, every encounter with divine brings reverence, awareness of own sin, humility, grace, change. Paul, he sees God in the holiness of the law, Romans chapter 7, 24, and he says, What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me? Ezekiel, he sees God in the vision and he drops down like dead on his face. John sees God in a vision and he, feel, fell, he fell down as dead. And listen, folks, just after you realize that you are a sinner and you are undone, you are terminated, just then you experience grace. No one will ever benefit of grace, regardless how much they know and talk about grace, before they acknowledge how they really are and how desperate need they have for God. Listen, watch here. I saw him, John, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 17. I fell down on my, at his feet as dead, and then when you fell down in God's presence, grace takes place. He's, he put his hand on me and said, do not be afraid. That's where grace comes in. Isaiah says, I am a sinner. I am undone. And God sends the angel and says, your sins are atoned for. When atonement, when does atonement take place, folks? After you know who you are. Never before. It's just an idea, an illusion. You need to see the paradox of the gospel. The love and the holiness of God. The presence, the holiness of God creates reverence. And then it makes you compare to God to see how you are. How desperate you need him. And then as you realize how you are, you forget to judge others. And you say, Lord, help me. Have mercy on me. Just then, God can touch you with forgiveness and grace and give you new birth, a new heart salvation and peace. Listen, this is bad news. The vision given to Isaiah represents what? Whoa. Should I say it or you read it for yourself? The condition of God's people in the last days. Who is that? Uh, as they look by faith into the Holy of Holies and they see Christ in the sanctuary, they perceive that they are unclean people. You can keep reading. I already said what I had to say. Then they humble themselves and then there is hope for them. Review and Herald, December 22, 1896. Have you encountered God? If not, your religion is dead, empty. It is essential to experience this vision. It is essential because that is what will change our life forever, totally, dramatically. Because, listen folks, our nature doesn't see self. Our nature is so self-centered, self so proud, so ego-centered, that unless we are confronted by God's holiness, by a vision of God, 
we are not likely to be affected by grace. We must have an encounter with the Holy God if anything lasting is going to happen in our life ever. Jesus says to the disciples, unless a seed would die, it will never bear fruit. John 12, 24. Jesus says, he who loses his life will save it. Matthew 10, 39. Self is the enemy we must need to fear. Self is in need to be crucified. Not the others, they are not the enemies. Our pride must first die before God can be alive in us. Our pride must collapse. Self-righteousness must come to an end. Our arrogance must vanish if Christ is to be alive in us. This truth is so essential that there will be no salvation without it. Listen, folks, what happened to Isaiah next? Oh, I like this quotation. The end of self is the beginning of God. What happened to Isaiah next? He says, woe to me. And then at the end he says, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And I said, here I am, Lord. Send me. He is finally called to ministry. Well, 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 well. Didn't he serve God before? Or he thought like Paul, that he was serving God. But he really served self. Folks, only, you, only after you see God and you see yourself and you experience the, the call touching your lips, the grace, the atonement, only then you can serve God powerfully. No wonder people don't get changed. We will never save anybody before we are saved. We cannot share what we don't have. As soon as you see God, and then you see your sinfulness, and you see your need for God, and you experience grace, and you die to self, then Christ lives in you. Only then God can call you and use you with power. The most powerful force of attraction on earth, it's a life filled with Christ presence that's evangelism the single that works and christ's presence comes after we die we must die together with christ in order to live together with christ so no wonder we come to church but we can do so little god can do so little to us so, folks, we need a healthy, balanced view of who God is. We need to see him face to face, each one of us. We need to experience God's holiness and his presence. The way up is the way down and the other way around. We need to have a correct vision of God. We need to have the fear, the reverence of God. That fear, if you have it in your heart, protects you, the angel of the Lord protect those who fear him that fear gives you wisdom the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom that fear adds length to your life that fear avoids evil that fear i could go on and on i found several bible verses in proverbs about the fear of god all of them good why would you say that fear is bad when people say oh god is just love Really, they say, I want to do what, what I do. And their life is just ruined because of the view they have about God. So, this is the solution. We need to see God, to know God, because to know God is life eternal. We need to have the vision that Isaiah had. I'm going to read you a quotation. We need to come to the church to actually see God, not for a program. Listen carefully what Tozer says in the book, The Knowledge of the Holy. So necessary to the church is a lofty concept of God that when that concept in any measure declines, the church with her worship and her moral standards decline. The first step down for a church is taken when it surrenders its high opinion of God. 
Before the Christian church goes into eclipse anywhere, there must first be a corrupting of her simple basic theology. She simply gets a wrong answer to the question, what is God? And from there goes everything. Though she may continue her creed and her uh, doctrines and so on, everything is false. The mass of her adherents come to believe that God is different from what he actually is. And that's heresy of the most insidious and deadly kind. The heaviest obligation lying upon Christian church today is to purify her concept of God until it is once more worthy of him and worthy of her in all her prayers and labors. This should have the first place. Isn't that powerful? Folks, so what are the three things that we must experience in order to be changed? We must mingle everything we do with the holy presence of God. That brings the gospel. And the gospel transforms lives. So what are the three things? We need to see the Lord as he is. We need to see our own sinfulness that follows after we see God. And we need to experience grace that follows after we see who we are. Then God can use us in a powerful way and we'll be able to do things that we will never do on our own. Miracles. There was a girl, her name is Andra, and she was into drugs, deep into other things, prostitution and so on, alcohol, smoking, a lot more than I want to talk about. And her parents stuck to me and said, she doesn't come to church, she doesn't talk to us, she has no interest in our prayers, there is nothing we can do. So I talked to her and she said, leave me alone. And I knew she likes mountains. So I organized a trip in the mountains in Romania. And I invited her on. And she said, I come on the condition that you don't talk to me about God. You don't invite me to your kumbaya songs. You don't invite me to your prayers. You don't ask me to be baptized and to repent. I said, deal. I promise I will not talk to you about God unless you ask about God. And every night as we talk, I started to talk with the youth about encountering God, seeing God for yourself, not talking about God, but have you really seen God? Or church is false, is fake. And she was in her tent, and sure she heard us, because the tents were side by side. And one night, after about three nights, she comes out and she says, stop talking about holiness. I said, you want me to talk about love? No, love doesn't do anything for anybody. People abuse love. I said, well, the deal was that you go back in your tent and I keep talking to the others. So leave me alone. That was the deal. So she goes back in her tent and she comes five minutes later and she says, if that's real, why I prayed and God never helped me change? Why I don't have the power to change? Why I hate myself and I try to kill myself? And I said, because you have never seen God. Oh, I know all about God. I said, yes, you do. But you don't know God. You have never seen him face to face. And she said, well... How do you see him face to face? And I told her, I said, hey, draw near to him. Call him. Invite him. Whoever calls the name of the Lord will be saved. If you mean what you ask, he will come. You need to call him daily. Call him, ask him, Lord, I want to see you. I want to experience you. Call him. Call him every day. In Isaiah says, if you seek me with all your heart, you will. But you need to mean it. Seek him every day. Say, I want to see you even if I die. He says, is that going to change anything? I said, well, you never know before you try. Are you willing to try? And she said, yes. Just about two weeks later, she came to me crying. And she said, I kept asking him, though I did not believe in anything. In fact, I hated him. And she said, last night, I saw him. I was very curious, but she never told me how. But she said, I saw him. And in his presence, I felt that I will die. And she said, as I saw him, I knew that I don't deserve to live. And I said, then why did you come? Look who you are and look who I am. And God said, I came to save you. 
I didn't come to condemn you. So she said, he came to me. And he doesn't want to kill me. He wants to save me. I said, didn't he talk to you about Sabbath and food? No. Didn't he talk to you about tofu? No. My mom does that. Didn't he talk to you about Sabbath? No. He didn't talk to you about not lying and not smoking. No. He just, just showed himself. Folks, she got baptized. She went back to church. She went to medical school. She finished. She has a family. She's extremely dedicated. She tells me, I cannot help but tell everybody. They need to see Jesus too, the way I saw him. And they tell me that they are Adventists. They've never seen Jesus as I did. This is what we need. I am asking you today, are you Isaiah phase one? Woe to them! Are you Isaiah phase one? Lifeless, cold, le without power religion? Doctrines? Or are you Isaiah phase two? I've seen the Lord and I'm undone, but he has touched me. Where are you? I want to invite you today to experience that encounter with God and to see how you really are and then to be touched by his grace and to be changed and to be saved and to be called and to serve. If you want that, make a decision now. Don't do it tomorrow. Israel died because they procrastinated. There is no tomorrow. Every time we procrastinate, we learn last Sabbath, what happens to our hearts? They get hardened. Do not procrastinate. Today, make that decision that you are going to ask him to come in, that you want to see him every day. He may not show up 40 years like Moses in the wilderness because he was not ready. But if you invite him daily, he will show up in a way or in a different way. He will. Invite him every day because that's going to change your religion. You'll not just be an Adventist, you'll also be a Christian. You follow me? You'll not be just a Christian, you'll be a real one. Then God will be able to use you. If you want that, I want to invite you to stand up and let's pray together. You will pray alone in your mind. And after one minute, I will pray for you. Amen. Father in heaven, we pray today as individuals and as a church that you help us have the vision that Isaiah had. That you help us encounter you as you are. That you help us to experience you at home and at church in your temple. And as we encounter you, help us realize how we are and how much we need you. And just then, we know that we'll experience real grace, forgiveness, lasting change. And just then, we know that you can call us and use us in ways that we'll never imagine. Because that's what it's all about. Christ in us. That's the hope. May you be in us to the point that we will stop being. To the point that we will be crucified and die daily. And you will live in us. We make that decision right now. And we ask you for help. Because we cannot do it alone. We pray these things in Jesus' powerful, precious name. Thank you for answering. We praise you. Amen.